Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Travis. If you would please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, thank you, Travis, for filling in for Brian. The Rascals are down on a mission trip, I believe in Mexico. So thank you, Travis, for stepping in. And uh, we are continuing a walk through uh, the book of Ephesians. And we have come to Ephesians chapter 4. We've been looking at... Yeah, could you go turn me down? I'm very... We've been trying. <laughs> I would make a comment, but it would ring. All right, that's better. Now I can say what I want to know. Um, all right, so Ephesians chapter 4, we come to verses 8 to 10. And uh, we've been looking at uh, experiencing the fullness of God. We've talked about so much. The thing about reading a book of the Bible is we read that. We've been going over this for a while now. But you have to remember this is one letter. This is one thought. So I know that it's difficult, but you need to remember everything from chapter 1 to the previous verse. you got to pick up everything that Paul is saying. So I'm going to remind you of some of these things because when we get into this text particularly, people get a little confused and they take it out of the context of what the entire book of Ephesians. And uh, there's a point to be made here. There are other things that this can teach, but there's a point to be made about this and I want us to talk about it. We've been looking at, and we talked about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father is over all, in all, and through all. And then last week we talked about in verse 7, a grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. And we talked about how each of us are uniquely, just as a baby is born and is unique from all of its siblings, yet part of the same family, we each are born, reborn with the Spirit, with God's character, and gifts, each unique, and we discover those gifts, okay, as we grow older. All right, so now we're digging into, we come to 8 to 10, and this is the basis by which, because he talks about Messiah's gifts, and a good way to understand Paul when he writes is he has a lot in his brain. Okay, this guy's a guy that probably had a couple, two, three, four PhDs. So he has a lot on his brain. So when he sees a theological point, it's like a dog and a squirrel. Squirrel! Okay, and so he talks about Messiah's gift, and it reminds him of the basis of why Jesus has the authority to give gifts. So he tells you, in the middle of his sentence. Do you talk to someone like that? They'll be talking to you, and then all of a sudden they start talking about something else. And then they come back to what they were originally talking about. Julie, don't you say nothing. <laughs> she works with me every day, so, you know. Anyway. <laughs> yes, chasing rabbits like I am now. Yeah. And so Paul does that when he writes. And I think a lot of it is because Paul didn't always write. Paul would speak. And so someone else would write. So they're writing everything he's saying. Well, you know, squirrel, squirrel, rabbit, rabbit, you know. And so sometimes that's reflected in his writings, not to make them any less authoritative. It just reveals to you how human it is. And yet it's the inspired words of God. And, this is, and, the, and the reason that works is the very scripture he's talking about. So we're in Ephesians chapter 4. We're beginning in verse uh, eight, and so uh, let's read seven just because, you know, it's starting with four it says it's kind of weird. Um, now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity. Or as some of your Bibles may say, he took captive, capti captives captivity or something weird like that. Um, and he gave gifts to people. Verse 9, but, when he, but what does he ascended mean? 
except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, did y'all catch that? Okay, let's, let's break that down a little bit. Break it down, okay? Christ's victory over all flesh. That's our first point. Christ's victory over all flesh. Christ's victory over all flesh. If you really want to understand why Jesus came, and you want to understand what I believe God was looking at, and what he was excited about, it comes to this passage. Because this explains what Jesus was coming to do. Okay? So Jesus' victory, Christ's victory over all flesh. All right? This is actually a quote. In, in, in my Bible, it's bolded and it's centered. Does your Bible do that? Okay? That usually means that this is a scripture. It's Psalm 68, 18. It is a, a psalm about David's victory over a Jebusite uh, city. And it talks about the traditions of the kings and what they would do. I don't, you know, we don't do that these days, but um, what they would do when they would go to war and they would win the war, that's very significant, and they would come back. So it would be much of a celebration. Okay? And so we're going to look at it. Uh, the first thing that the king would bring would he would bring the spoils of war. Okay, so if he go into a city, like when Jerusalem was ransacked by the Romans, they went into the temple and they took everything out of the temple. So they had the gold menorah, they had all of that stuff walking out of the city. So they brought it into a, and how do we know about it? Because they put a chiseled end into stone in, in Rome. It was a celebration of their conquering of that city, because Jerusalem had been a pain to them, to say the least. And um, so anyway, it was just a sign of those spoils of war, the, the, the taking over that nation, taking their precious items, and putting it on display for all to see. Well, what, what war are we talking about? Are you talking between God and Satan, or... What battle did Jesus come to fight? Well, you learned about it this morning in Sunday school. Didn't you? What was the Sunday school lesson this morning? Adam and Eve in the fall. And what happened in that? Do it. They fell hard, okay. <laughs> yeah? What was introduced into the world at that moment? Sin. And what is the result? What is birth from sin? Death. Has mankind ever been able to shake that? Could mankind ever shake that? Not without divine intervention. Sin was at home and rested in the hearts of man. The result of that is death. Sin, when full grown, gives birth to death. James chapter 1. So we have a problem, a major problem. The sin resides in the midst of me, therefore it produces death all in me, and not just the... <laughs> dead six feet under, but death in my relationships, death in how I speak, death in how I think, everything, death, 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 death. I can't even see God right because I twist, just like Satan came and twisted the words of God. We do the same thing. No amen on that one. All right. And we choose our own way. We just like Adam and Eve, we choose a way that we could be like God, run our own lives, do it our way. Isn't that how you? 
We don't want to be submissive to anybody. We want to try things on our own. Everybody makes mistakes. Some of you knew my hand of Montana reference. All right. But nobody sins. Nobody falls into judgment. We just make mistakes. That's not what this passage teaches. What it shows is that there was a war that was started on that day, and it was a war inside the heart of man that he was created in the image of God, but he had defiled that image by sin. And as much as God desired to have a relationship with man, there is a part of us that, as the hymn writer says, that is prone to wander. Okay? And so the war that we have is war with sin itself, but predominantly the general of sin, which is death. And so when Jesus came and was born of a virgin, and all of these things, he was born in the flesh and was born under that curse. Do you follow me so far? That is why Jesus came. He came to tackle sin and death head on. And in his life, he overcame sin and never yielded it to it. Amen. Thank you. That's right. Okay? And so in his death, he died in the body that was condemned to death, but his spirit was alive into righteousness. So that happened. Thank you. He rose from the dead, okay? And when he rose, there's a conquering of death. Okay? So understand the imagery. There's actually three imageries here. There's the, the ascension. Uh, the rabbis taught it that the, the Psalm 68 taught of the ascension on Sinai. So the way they see it, there's Sinai. And then David is, is talking pre about the sanctuary, about the temple that would be built. The same cloud would come and rest in that. And then the third, if you want to add to it with this text, is Jesus now coming and him ascending and him doing this, giving gifts to us. Okay? But he conquered. And what he conquered was death itself. All right? So the spoil of the war then here, the spoils that he is displaying is his authority over flesh. He talked about that a bunch. And that's what he was excited about. Because he didn't have any authority to come into your life and help you. Well, what do you mean, Brother Reagan? What I mean is, is he to be introduced into your life and everything in your life he had to condemn. Death. Boom, smack, complete separation. He couldn't be around you. But when he resurrected, it demonstrated his authority over flesh. Now he had the opportunity, if you wanted him to, to save you. He couldn't help you before. And so he's displaying this authority. Of, hey, give me some fish. Watch this. Now watch me go through the wall. Whoa. He's demonstrating his authority over all flesh. He can do anything he wants to do, not just in the spirit, but in the human body. And just as he overcame sin, a flesh born into that could also overcome sin by the same spirit that he had. Amen. Preach it. You don't have to be that way. You choose to. Unbeliever don't have a choice. Believer has a choice. And there's a new way, we'll get into that later in Ephesians chapter 4, there's a new way that we're to call it to walk in. And that'll close out Ephesians. Paul talking about that. The new life. But right now we're talking about that gift that God gives us. It's authority over the flesh. But also, and this goes back into the beginning of Ephesians, he, he demonstrates his authority over enemies and prisoners. You remember that he sat us in the heavenlies. He gave us spiritual authority. 
in every authority that had a power because of sin, every even death, any authority that it had, it is now under his authority. All supernatural, all authorities answer to his name. And everyone who bears that name. Let me repeat that. All principalities and powers are submissive to, uh, to his name and to everyone who bears it. And this is why Paul says, you know, this is important enough to write. Because when he is centered on high, remember, Jerusalem's on the mountain. And so he's ascending into, as a victorious king, he's ascending with the, the prisoners, but also this captive captivity thing. What is that? You ever heard of a prisoner of war? In war, people get captured. And people are bound by the enemy. And sin and death had everybody captive. And so one of the things that they would do is they would parade around, not, they would parade around their people that had been captured. They would recapture them and bring them. That's taking the captives captive and bringing them home and parading them in front of people. We brought them back. They were bound, but now they're free. This is the point. And he's in WD-40, I'm sorry. Okay, speak, speak, speak. All right. You just get used to it. Anyway, it's kind of like my knee. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sin of death. Anyway, so the point is that God brings the captives free, sets the captive free from sin, from death. What's he do? He sets the captive free from what? Say it with me. From sin, from death. Okay, now say it. He set me free from sin, from death. Do you believe that? How is it demonstrated when you leave this place? Are there things that you think that you can't overcome? Your temper, your impatience, your unkindness. Well, I just can't be gentle towards that person. Really? I just can't control my mouth. And, you know, I was born with that's the way I was, raised. Really? Jesus conquered the dead and you can't conquer your tongue? You can't conquer your temper? You can't conquer your, your appetites that cause you to spend more than you can spend? Really? That's not what that scripture teaches. Jesus said, I have been given authority over all flesh, and that includes yours. You're not dominated by that anymore. All right. <laughs> and so he gave gifts to men. All right? So when he ascended on high, so we'll, dig to, we'll get down to the, the descending here in a minute. So when he ascended on high, he conquered everything, and so all the people, what's the result? All the people that are part of the kingdom, they share in the spoils. All those, all the, and that was the thing in David's army. If you were in David's army, everybody got their cut. And there was one time where a group went out fighting and one group stayed back with the stuff. You remember that? You remember that? Yeah. There you go, and he's like, oh yeah, preacher brother. And they went back and so the guys came back. They'd been fighting and everything. And they said, well, they shouldn't get anything. They didn't battle. And David said, well, we wouldn't have anything here if, if they weren't here, so they get equal share. They didn't do that. Don't matter. They get equal share. And that's the point. Everybody in the kingdom receives, everybody that fights, everybody has been a part of that. All the captives we receive from the king. Okay? Everybody. 
All right, there's no one special. We got different gifts. We have different portions. But we all receive the same. All right. Ascending, descending, filling. That's verses 9 and 10. Ascending, descending, and filling. That's the three points that I see here that we need to focus on. But what does he ascended mean except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth? Thank you. Some people think hell, that he went into hell, and that's where he, you know. And that's an interpretation, and there's some thoughts there. There's other scriptures that go with that. What's the point of this scripture? What's he trying to tell us? But that wasn't what he was excited about. Power over death and power to help us. See, this is talking about the incarnation. If you go back and read the Gospels and see how many Jesus, how many times Jesus calls him the Son of Man. How many times does he say that about himself? He loved to emphasize, I'm a man. You know why? He'd never been a man before. For all eternity, he had been God. And then all of a sudden, in some freaky instance, because it is freaky, God becomes a man. He said, look at this. It's nuts. Crazy. That's the craziest thing you'll ever see, is that God became a man. That's just weird. But it's true, nonetheless. And he descended to the lower parts. And when we think of lower parts, usually people say, hell, the, word, the Hebrew word there is Sheol. And Sheol is the word for a grave, the place of the dead. So it's referencing death itself. So in essence, what he's talking about here is he that is sitting, so he was from heaven, and he descended to not just earth, but the lower parts of it. Not just to be in life with us, but even to, as this family who's grieving over this boy this weekend, he is right there with them. He didn't just come to the good parts of our life. He came to, he dealt with the sin and the ugly and the nasty. He didn't just go to the, to the, to the priest's courts and talk to the, the people in, in the temple. He also went to the region of Gadarenes and went to the tombs and met the man that was filled with the thousand demons. He's not intimidated by any of it. He came to conquer all of it. Okay, so he descended, <clears throat> became a man, lower parts, conquered all things in life and death. Okay. Oh, I forgot about that. Let's just hit that one too. He ascended. Okay, so first he came down, then he went up. And he was chomping at it. Did you notice when he got to those 40 days, and especially when he got to that last week, have you ever noticed how he was kind of like a horse, you know, Chomping the bit because, you know, a horse, when you're going away from the house, you know, they're kind of hesitant. But when you turn around and they see that path, <laughs> they start going. <laughs> yeah. And so when Jesus got to that point, he's like, now it's home. It's on. And he wasn't excited about the cross. Scriptures say he endured the suffering of the, the pain of the cross for the joy that was set before him. What joy? This joy. When he ascended to the Father, a whole new thing stopped, started. He ascended in authority. It wasn't just that he had authority on earth. He has authority in heaven. And in heaven, he has authority over the flesh. That's a whole different ball of wax. That never happened before. If you want to fully understand that, we need a pot of coffee and some time. All right? So you just have to take it as it is. I could go in that way. would be here another 30 minutes. All right. He sits at the right hand of the Father. 
He intercedes for us. He prays for us. He appeals to the Father for us. He is, he is lobbying on our behalf, just as they lobby in Washington, D.C., and they lobby in Austin. God, Jesus, is sitting at the throne of heaven lobbying for you, lobbying for this church, lobbying for that family. He is there interceding, doing everything that he can for the people of the flesh. But he said to Peter, and he was betrayed. He said, look, Satan's, man, Satan's coming after you, boy. You're sitting here talking all this smack. He's, he wishes to sift you like wheat. But you know what? I've been praying for you. And he was limited in the flesh. Imagine how he prays now. With his lips to the ear of the Father. What do we have to worry about? What are we afraid of? And why do we not exercise faith when we have a friend like that? Anyway. Lastly, to fill all things. Understand, this is the whole point. Why did you, he obtained all authority over all things that he can fill all things with his glory? Take him back what the enemy took. leading back those who were bound in bondage and sin, those who were bound to death in a life of godlessness. We look at this and say, nobody can change that person. You don't understand the hand of God. You don't understand the power of God. And we talk about our experiences and not about the Bible and not about God. A God who spoke everything in existence in six days, and he's limited? He can't do what? And so what his desire is, is that's the demonstration of our own nature, of our own sinless sinfulness, our own godlessness, and our limited, confined mortal bodies that are condemned to death because of our own actions. And what Jesus came to do is like, Dude, you have absolutely no idea what it means that you were made in the image of God. And now I have given you authority over this thing that corrupts and deceives. I've given you authority over that. Here, I'm going to give you a little taste. Here's a little spirit. Bing. He doesn't want to feel... He wants to fill us so that we will be filled with the goodness and the glory of God. And he brought the things that the enemy had taken away and he gave it back to us. The relationship with God, the full right standing with God that was stolen away from us so that God could allow his spirit to dwell in us that we could do all things through him. And that in that, he would be glorified and then so much give glory back to the Father. And that's a quick summary of the whole New Testament. Jesus came down as a man, took on death, conquered it, sits at the right hand of the Father and has all authority and he's just waiting on us. Anybody watch the horse race yesterday, Belmont Stakes? Nobody? A few of us? You see that's what you, it's always interesting trying to watch them get into those little stalls. You know, you know, they're trying to race and you gotta get in this little spot. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's like trying to get a two year old two year old to be still, you know. You know, but once they get out, once you do what Jesus did, what, what did Jesus do? It's real simple. 
Jesus had to die. And he did it well. He died good. And too many of us here, we're still trying to live our lives. We're trying to get the best life that we want. And our life is driven by our appetites. It's driven by our desires that are corrupted and deceitful. And what we have to do is when we come to the cross, Jesus said it best, is that if anyone would come after me, then he must first deny himself. You don't get there what you want. You must take up your cross and you must follow me. If you can't do this, you can't be my disciple. All of us have to be like Jesus. He is our model. And the, first, the thing that he did to conquer his flesh, he had to die. The thing that he did when he, he emptied himself of himself, he only did what the Father said. He was completely obedient, he was submissive, humble. He was the only person on the whole planet that had the right to be, have any pride. Yet he had none. Have you died like Jesus did? Have you completely died to every hope and every dream and everything that you want so that you can have Christ? Well, I don't think I've ever made a decision like that. <clears throat> How many of you are married? You made a decision like that. You had all these ideas and oh, Here's this other person. They have all these ideas, and then you try to merge those together. <laughs> That's funny. Two selfish, independent people trying to live together. Woo! You wouldn't trade it. Okay? And the reality is, you have God who's independent from you. You are independent from him, and his desire is that you would know him. But you have to, just like in marriage, you have to make a covenant. You have to make a decision to be with him. And then you have to maintain that all of your days. Have you done that? But marriage isn't, you know, you get married and then you just go your separate ways, right? Right? And you show up one, day, one time a week and y'all talk and then you go for 20 minutes and then you go away, right? Isn't that way marriage works? Don't work that way with God either. You don't make a commitment to him, then once a week you come and you see him, and then you go on and do your stuff. <laughs> well, that just wasn't nice. But it's true. It's a daily, intimate relationship. Have you died to yourself? Is he resurrected in you? We'll get into the gifts next week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the way that you love this. Thank you that you had the authority and the power to conquer sin, to conquer death, even when we could not. And today you stand holding the opportunity of freedom from these things and an opportunity for relationship with you and a life full of all things you. But we have to die to ourselves and our wants and our desires. Give us grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me, please?